Mark chapter 13. But of course it's like a bird's eye view. Mark 13. And as he was going out of the temple, one of his disciples said to him, Teacher, see what stones and what buildings. And Jesus answering said to him, Seek thou these great buildings? Not a stone shall be left upon a stone which shall not be thrown down. And as he sat on the Mount of Olives opposite the temple, Peter and James and John and Andrew asked him privately, Tell us, when shall these things be? And what is the sign when all these things are going to be fulfilled? And Jesus answering them began to say, Take heed, lest any one mislead you, for many shall come in my name, saying, It is I, and shall mislead many. But when ye shall hear of wars and rumors of wars, be not disturbed, for this must happen, but the end is not yet. For nation shall rise up against nation, and kingdom against kingdom, and there shall be earthquakes in different places, and there shall be famines and troubles. These things are the beginnings of foes. But ye take heed to yourselves, for they shall deliver you up to senedrims and to synagogues, Ye shall be beaten and be brought before rulers and kings for my sake, for a testimony to them. And the gospel must first be preached to all nations. But when they shall lead you away to deliver you up, be not careful beforehand as to what ye shall say, nor prepare your discourse, but whatsoever shall be given you in that hour, that speak. For ye are not the speakers, but the Holy Spirit. But brother shall deliver up brother to death, and father, child, and children shall rise up against parents and cause them to be put to death. And ye will be hated of all on account of my name. But he that has endured to the end, he shall be saved. But when ye shall see the abomination of desolation standing where it should not, he that reads, let him consider it, then let those in Judea flee to the mountains, and him that is upon the housetop not come down into the house, nor enter into it to take away anything out of his house. And him that is in the field not return back to take his garment. But woe to those that are his child and to those that give suck in those days. And pray that it may not be in winter time, for those days shall be distress such as there has not been the like since the beginning of creation which God created until now and never shall be. And if the Lord had not cut short those days, no flesh, should have been saved, but on account of the elect whom he has chosen, he has cut short those days. And then, if any one say to you, Lo, here is the Christ, or Lo, there, believe it not, for false Christ and, and false prophets will arise and give signs and wonders to deceive, if possible, even the elect. But do ye take heed? Behold, I have told you all things beforehand. But in those days, after that distress, the sun shall be darkened and the moon shall not give its light. And the stars of heaven shall be falling down, and the powers which are in the heaven shall be shaken. And then shall they see the Son of Man coming in clouds with great power and glory. And then shall he send his angels, and shall gather together his elect from the four winds from end of earth to end of heaven. But learn the parable from the fig tree. When its branch already becomes tender and puts forth the leaves, ye know that the summer is near. Thus also ye... When ye see these things happening, know that it is near at the doors. Verily I say unto you, this generation shall in no wise pass away till all these things take place. The heaven and the earth shall pass away, but my words shall in no wise pass away. But of that day, or of that hour, no one knows, neither the angels who are in heaven, nor the Son, but the Father. Take heed, watch and pray. For ye do not know when the time is. It's a man, it's as a man gone out of the country, having left his house and given to his bondman the authority and to each one his work, and commanded the doorkeeper that he should watch. Watch therefore, for ye do not know when the master of the house comes, evening or midnight or cock crow or morning, lest coming suddenly he find you sleeping. But what I say to you, I say to all, watch. In this portion of scripture, where we have a presentation of the servant, as we have seen in other studies, we have come to a portion there he is presented in a very interesting way. The servant is presented as king in chapter 11. We have seen that when he gave orders to uh, fetch this um, colt, and then the Lord was introduced into Jerusalem, 
as the king. Now notice, always it is connected with the fact that he is presented as a servant. But he, the servant is also the king. Of course, in Matthew's gospel there is much more emphasis on his being the king. But here he is the servant, but as servant he is also the king. In chapter 12, of which we studied the last time, but that's now more than a year ago, we had the priest. The servant is also the priest who takes interest in the things of God. And we have noticed especially the things in connection with the house of God. I'll just summarize them very briefly. In connection with the house of God, we have prayer. We found it already in chapter 11. In connection with the house of God, the Lord shows great authority. In chapter 11 also, in verse 21, uh, 28, by what authority does thou these things? And so then the Lord shows that. So in connection with the house, uh, he's, he is really a priest who takes care of the interests of God. So the early part of chapter 11, the king who is presented, but then uh, in the middle of the chapter we have already uh, details about the house of God. And so it continues. He is the cornerstone. And we have seen uh, also how he would maintain God's rights in connection with service. And we have seen practical lessons for us in connection with that. And then we have seen also the key verse, chapter 10, verse 45, which is always good to uh, remind ourselves of, for also the Son of Man did not come to be ministered to, but to minister and give his life a ransom for many. And we've noticed that the beginning of Mark's Gospel goes together with this thought that he came to minister, to serve. And that the second part, from this portion on, from 10 verse 45 on, emphasizes then how he would give his life a ransom for many. And of course, his sacrifice, we see then especially in chapter 15 and 16. But to come back to the thought of the house of God, where the Lord is also the great servant, of course, uh, he has brought uh, before us the importance of the power of resurrection. You've seen the last time that uh, he had to reproach the Sadducees in 12 or 24, do not ye therefore err, not knowing the scriptures, nor the power of God. And if I don't forget it, we'll come back to that also in uh, tonight's study in connection with the Holy Spirit. There you also have the power of God. But here in 12 verse 24, the Lord refers to the power of God in resurrection. They didn't know that. But in connection with the house of God, there is uh, the power of God in resurrection. That's really the basis for it all. And so we have seen that in the house of God, those are there who love God. And those have the um, relationship with God who dwells there. They acknowledge Him as such. And they acknowledge the Lord Jesus as the Son, the true Son. And then the last portion we uh, meditated a little bit upon, and that's also then the introduction for tonight, is at the end of chapter 12, the poor widow. The poor widow really responds to what we find in the Lord Jesus, that is complete, total commitment out of love for the Lord. This attitude we find in the poor widow. And it's very remarkable that the Lord Jesus notices this. If you study Mark's Gospel, you see how the Lord Jesus takes note of everything. He notices what is going on, and he reflects upon this, as he does here in chapter 12, verse 41, when he sat down opposite the treasury and saw how the crowd was casting money into the treasury. This is an element, of course, a priest notices, because he is interested in the things of God. And again, that supports this thought, the Lord is here the true priest, but he's also the true judge. He knows what's going on, and he can really see through everything. He also notice, uh, knows what is in the heart. So he reveals the motives. These two mites, the widow uh, threw in the, um, uh, the box that was standing there for the treasury, uh, may also represent the two aspects that the Lord presented there, that we should maintain God's rights as well as the rights of Caesar as citizens here on this earth, that he would respect God's rights and the rights of the neighbor. But this, this total commitment which I would like to underline in this woman. And we will see that also in chapter 14, some elements of this commitment, as we find in the widow, you find that also in the man who has prepared the guest chamber for the Lord, and you see that also in the attitude of Mary, who had saved up a lot of money to be able to anoint the feet of the Lord and his head. That is the same type of commitment. And this commitment, of course, we see in perfection in the Lord himself as a true servant. And so he would really appreciate if he sees something like that in the widow. Although there may be a lack of uh, knowledge, lack of insight in what's really going on, the widow is characterized by real interest in the things of God, real love for him, and real commitment. In contrast to what we see now in these buildings, 
where we have the same principles as in Laodicea and also in the Great Babylon. Now, before we uh, really uh, go into this, I would like to notice another point in chapter 13, verse 1, and that introduces then the study for tonight. In chapter 13, verse 1, we see that the Lord Jesus was going out. That's very solemn. In chapter 11, verse 11, we have noticed already that he, having looked round on all things, that you have exactly the same thing that I tried to explain in connection with the widow. The Lord sits down and considers everything. 11, verse 11 says, having looked round on all things, the hour being already late, he went out to Bethany with the twelve. So he left them. He could not stay there overnight. Perhaps that was on the same Sunday evening that he was in Bethany to be to have that meal that they had prepared there, John 12. It's just a suggestion. But the point now is that he went out. And that is repeated a couple of times in uh, Mark's Gospel. I think also in chapter 11, verse 19. When it was evening, he went forth without the city. He could not stay there during the night. And now he was going out. This is a very definite movement. And so that also presents something very special. Here, in this chapter, we are going to see the Lord as prophet. So the servant is the king, he is the priest, but he is also the prophet. And as a prophet, he uh, reveals God's thoughts in connection with the future. But not only that, the prophet also reveals the true moral character of things. So the Lord presents an outline of things to come, but he also shows, as the prophet, the real character of the things. And that is why he went out. And reading this, I was thinking of what happened in the Old Testament in the days of Ezekiel the glory of the Lord departed from the city first from the temple then at the entrance of the temple Ezekiel 9 to 11 you can see it and then gradually outside the temple outside the city and then to the Mount of Olives and the Lord here traces the same way that's very interesting he goes out from the temple from the city there and goes to Mount Olives the Mount of Olives that is what happened in Ezekiel you find it also uh, earlier already in connection with the, um, in the days of Eli when the Lord uh, le- um, let the Philistines capture the ark. Then also he forsake uh, the ark in that sense and he withdrew. But in Ezekiel it is more clear. And so, and that is now another parallel I want to draw with the history of the church. You see also how the Lord Jesus now is outside in a sense. He's outside the collective testimony. In Laodicea he is standing at the door outside that's terrible he's walking among the candlesticks uh, Revelation 1 but morally the situation is so bad that there is nothing left for him that he can identify with he's outside and so here also in connection with Judaism we find the Lord outside that is the first line I want to underline so we want to see first the line in connection with prophecy in connection with Israel and then this chapter has been given also for us to draw moral lessons for us from this and as I say the true prophet reveals the character of things and we draw moral lessons from this passage as well so the temple is under God's judgment the whole system was under God's judgment and we see more about that in this chapter but then it says one of his disciples says to him teacher see what stones and what buildings so this disciple did not understand yet the true character of these things as many Christians today also don't really see the true character of the great Babylon, Revelation 17, 18. But it's important then to be instructed. And that's what the Lord does. He instructs uh, his disciples. And it's very interesting how this comes about. But first, I want to say something about these stones. Teachers see what stones and what buildings. You know, the temple we are talking about here is the Herod's temple. It was not the temple of Solomon that was built according to David's contributions and instructions. Neither the temple of uh, after the Babylonian captivity under the high priest Sealtiel and Zerubbabel in those days it was with God's help and according to God's thoughts but this temple was built by Herod to please the Jews or uh, rebuilt, renovated and things were added and in John 2 we see that it took 46 years to complete and 40 years later the whole thing was gone but what I want to uh, underline from this here is a great temple but it is more or less imitation. It's not the real thing as God had given. But the Jews were very pleased with this, and outwardly this whole service still went on. Now, that is something similar we have in, in Christianity today. There are great things, man, magnific- magnificent things, but what is there for God, really? Now, the Lord starts to teach his disciples, and uh, in verse 2 we read, Jesus answering said to him, See thou these great buildings. 
not a stone shall be left upon a stone this is uh, this has been fulfilled literally because when the temple was destroyed by the Romans and Titus had even given instructions not to do anything with the temple but soldiers started to throw uh, fire inside and started to burn and so on and so burned down but then the gold started to melt and so the gold was also going all over the place and that is why later on they have ripped off uh, ripped apart every stone from each other to collect the gold but uh, the point here of course is that the Lord Jesus shows with this remark that this system is under God's judgment and that God would deal with it and I think we can uh, learn this lesson from this as we find in Hebrews the epistle to the Hebrews shows very clearly that what God had given in the Old Testament Moses and so on but now in the hands of man had become a camp which had cast out their own Messiah and so the camp became really a place under God's judgment. Hebrews explains that in more detail and I think this is really the context to see these things in this light that God was still waiting but judgment would come and now you can also see the application we can make to the uh, Christian profession. We are part of the Christian profession, don't forget that. Timothy shows it very clearly but also in 2 Timothy 3 we see that there's much done by imitation. Great things for in the eye of man but it is not really what God has given. So that is a similar character. As I said, the widow did not have much insight in this, neither the disciple who asked this question. He did not really see the things through as the Lord saw it through. And so we need instruction. And that's what comes now in verse 3 and 4. But it's interesting to see that the Lord said on the Mount of Olives in verse 3. That is to underline, he sees the things from God's viewpoint. The Mount of Olives was a place where he rested, where he spent the night. The Mount of Olives was a place, as I mentioned earlier, the uh, that the glory of God withdrew there. The Mount of Olives will be the place where the Lord Jesus will come back. It was the place also where he went up to heaven in Acts 1. And so the Mount of Olives is really a place in connection with God. It's a place also characterized by the Holy Spirit because the olive, as you know, perhaps from the Old Testament, is a fruit that really speaks of the Holy Spirit, the work of the Holy Spirit. Now, here we see that then the disciples came. And that's very interesting. They came with their question two pair of brothers, eh? Peter and Andrew were brothers, James and John were brothers. They came with the right attitude. And then the Lord can teach. If you come with the right attitude, then the Lord can teach. And there's a very interesting point here, which is not mentioned in Luke and in uh, Matthew. Here is Andrew mentioned. And uh, that is a little touch we find only in Mark's Gospel. So it's not the three who had a special place, special privilege, were in the Mount of Transfiguration with the Lord. They were with uh, Jerry's daughter when the Lord raised her, her they were in the garden of Gethsemane later on uh, here Andrew was with them and then they asked him privately that's another nice thing uh, that happened also in, uh, in Mark 9 that the, the, the disciples came to ask something privately and I think that is what the Lord also would uh, uh, like to see cultivated in us that we would have this approach that we would inquire from him what his thoughts are so they were ready to take in the Lord's thoughts. They started perhaps to see that, hey, there is something that uh, we don't see yet as the Lord sees it. And that can happen easily to, uh, with us also in connection with all kinds of questions. And then the point is, do we have this type of an attitude? Do we go with the Lord with our questions? Not to expose for everybody. These were things that the whole world did not really understand and grasp. But it was between the Lord and the disciples. The disciples, it says in verse 1, his disciple. The word disciple means somebody who is taught and instructed and so it's nice to see that the prophet the Lord Jesus continues on to teach as he does the whole gospel he's teaching his disciples and so he's teaching us today and a disciple of course is also a learner and a follower which we see throughout this gospel as well and which implies a great challenge for us now in verse 4 they come with this, this specific question in two points here Tell us when shall these things be and what is the sign when all these things are going to be fulfilled. The point I want to underline here, if you compare with Matthew 24, there you have three, uh, the question is divided in three points. And in Matthew 24, there you have really an overview of the dispensations. The whole Gospel of Matthew shows a change of dispensation and really brings out the course of the dispensations. That's not the subject in Mark, although he touches that same uh, type of teaching, but 
in Mark, again, it is to teach disciples. And I want to underline that point. It's not to present the flow of uh, prophetic events and then this dispensation and that dispensation and then the king is introduced. Of course, this background is there, but it's not the prime emphasis here in Mark's gospel. That is, I think, an important lesson for us to uh, see. So we have to know the prophetic line of things as developed in Matthew, but the emphasis is here on moral lessons to teach disciples now. And that is disciples there at that time before the church started and disciples who will be on the earth after the church will be gone. And uh, perhaps I can just introduce this as a little parenthesis now. I think when we uh, read this portion we have first to see that some parts of this prophecy were literally fulfilled in the year 70. It's not really the uh, subject in Matthew but you can see that especially when you compare this uh, Luke 21. And so there you have a little fulfillment of these things, partly. But then I think the whole passage, if you compare it with Matthew, also looks to the future, what will happen after the rapture. And so the disciples we find here speak also of the remnant that will be there on the earth after the rapture. So if you see the whole passage in the context of prophecy, then it is the disciples who are living there and you see certain details fulfilled in year 70 when the church was there but the church is not mentioned in this passage uh, uh, with so many words what we can find we can draw more lessons from this portion as we will see which applies to us too but they were given to disciples who were there before the church and over their heads the Lord also addresses the disciples who will be on this earth after the rapture of the church and so verse 4 speaks about these things that will be fulfilled and they say there is a fulfillment or a partial fulfillment in the year 70 AD when the temple was destroyed but then the real fulfillment of prophecy takes place after the rapture in the 70th year of uh, the 70th week of Daniel 9 but again it would take much time to go into Daniel 9 Daniel 11 and 12 Revelation 13 uh, you, you almost read almost need a special study on these chapters but they would be uh, very uh, important to give background information to understand a portion like this so I will refer to these portions from time to time very briefly but I think the main emphasis for us is to see there are moral lessons for the disciples then there are moral lessons for disciples today and there are also moral lessons then for the disciples who live on this earth after the rapture of the church when the Lord will have prepared that remnant among Israel who will then go out to present the gospel worldwide. We'll see that in a few moments. So then the Lord gives five warnings here. There are five warnings in a row. And uh, four times he says, take heed. And at the end of the chapter we have seen uh, three or four times, watch. So it's really a wake-up call, as it were. And uh, that's interesting. The Lord says in verse 5, Jesus answering them began to say, take heed. You could uh, say with uh, Old Testament language, Psalm 107, who is wise. We are here at the end of a dispensation. At the end of the dispensation, at that time, we are living at the end of a dispensation now, also. So therefore there are parallels. Who is wise? Who understands these things? Take heed. And these warnings then, first is, in verse 6, lest anyone mislead you. Of course, you can study every verse in itself, and it would, we could compare many, many scriptures to back up this thought of misleading. How Jews have been misled before the church period started, in connection with false messiahs, how Christians have been misled, or professing Christians, and how there will be a great misleading after the rapture of the church. But this work of the enemy to mislead, you can trace back all the time. The Galatians, Paul said, who has beguiled you, has bewitched you. And in Second Corinthians, we see great details about this eff these efforts of the enemy to mislead. First Timothy, Second Timothy, Colossians, many scriptures refer to that. First John especially also. So, again, you see, this is a study in itself that you can make on your own in connection with this thought that we should not be misled. For many shall come in my name. Not that the Lord will really send them, but they will pretend to be sent by the Lord. They will come in his name, and they even, not only that, they will say, it's I, I'm the one, I'm the Messiah. That is blatant, that is terrible if you see this uh, type of pretension, but that is also going on today, and that will be worse after the rapture of the church. So this type of misleading you see in many scriptures and you can study that. You find it also in the Old Testament. I'll give one example. In the days of Ahab, when Ahab wanted to uh, go to Gilead and then the Lord had allowed an evil spirit 
to occupy the minds of all these prophets, Baal prophets. And then a true spirit, the true prophet of the Lord came and he explained this whole situation. He was the only one who really spoke the truth. Uh, you can read it in 1 Kings 22. Very interesting chapter. And then in verse 7, the Lord says, But when ye shall hear of wars and rumors of wars, be not disturbed, for this must happen. So here we have also what we find today. Sometimes I'll just draw the lines with today, the mass media. But this will also be then true, of course, after the rapture of the church, that these rumors and so on will go on. But then the Lord says, be not disturbed. Uh, if there is a, a thing that is not clear, just make, uh, write it down and we will uh, try to answer your question then at the end. Because this is not easy. On the one hand, you, fo- you follow the prophetic outline and then you have to realize that these things will happen after the rapture of the church. On the other hand, we apply certain moral principles also for us today. And that might seem to be con- uh, contradictory or confusing, but it, in reality it is not. So verse 7, the Lord says, This must happen, but the end is not yet. This must happen. That's very interesting. In Revelation 1, you see the things that must happen. Uh, morally, this must happen. This is part of God's way. It must happen, but the end is not yet. It must happen in order that the end may come, finally. That is God's solution. That is in God's ways, the end will come. But the Lord gives you an outline of this whole development till the end will be reached. Then in verse 8, For nation shall rise up against nation. So here you have ethnic conflicts. That will, that's already the case today. Also, also, of course, political violence, anarchy. Uh, you find earthquakes. And again, that's a topic in itself. You could spend at least half an hour or an hour just about this, if you collect all the data that exists. Catastrophes. So verse 8 at the end, there shall be famines. Speaking about famines, how many people live in areas where there are famines? What a contrast with the millennium when the king will make sure that every, everyone will have food. It says at the end of verse 8, these things are the beginnings of throes, or the beginning of sorrows. That is a reference to birth pangs. You find literally in First Thessalonians 5, verse 3, that the Lord, uh, through Paul, speaks about this what will happen after the rapture, all these uh, things, and he compares it again with birth pangs. Birth pangs is in connection with the millennium that God is going to introduce, the reign of his beloved son. And so these birth pangs are to prepare the introduction of the king and the millennium. There are many Old Testament scriptures also they refer to this. And um, just a little reference, if you study prophecy, an outline of prophecy, and you see in the book of Revelation, you have the seals first, then the trumpets, and then the bowls or vials. And so I would suggest that the beginnings of sorrows or throws are, you can compare with the seal. So that is the first part of these judgments in God's providence, as we have in Revelation 6 especially. But then verse 9 here, but ye take heed. The third time that the Lord says this, heed yourself. Well, can't we apply that to us? Of course. It does not only apply to disciples who will live then in those times after the rapture of the church, in those difficult days, the same lessons we can apply to us. And by the way, verse 9 and 10 and 11 is only here in Mark's gospel. You find it also in Matthew 10, but you don't find these instructions in Matthew 24, where we have the Olivet Discourse. You don't find them in Luke 21. So as I said, you find in Matthew 10 an outline for disciples, and there again the connection with the time after the rapture is very evident there but here it is in connection with servants as Mark deals with the subject of service so the Lord wants a testimony here on this earth and he says they shall deliver you the testimony will not be accepted by the religious world by the Jewish leaders and of course again we find it in the book of Acts that you can follow the same line of things of opposition and so on but so it will be after the rapture of the church the same opposition and we see it also today in Israel, in a sense, how the authorities and the religious authorities are opposed uh, to the Messianic Jews. Now here in verse 9, at the middle of verse 9, the Lord says, they will deliver you up to Sanhedrims and synagogues, and as I said, that happened also literally in the book of Acts, this type of persecution, they shall beat, you shall be beaten and brought before rulers. Think of what happened with Paul in the book of Acts. Think think of uh, Stephen. And now I want you to notice this expression. The Lord says, for my sake. And I find it so beautiful. For my sake. A disciple is faithful to his master, loyal to his master, and he suffers. Here the master is the servant, the servant. 
And so his servants suffer for his sake. That's the only right motive. If you suffer because you want to be the popular guy, if you suffer because it compromises the world or with uh, the religious world, it's not for my sake. The Lord says here, if you suffer these things for my sake. That's what Paul also, to apply it now to the Christian uh, dispensation, Paul suffered that way, Second Timothy. And uh, Stephen, I mentioned already earlier, for my sake. It's uh, the only right motive. And um, I was thinking of another reference, but I can't think of it now where it is, but where we find a great emphasis, what we would do as a servant for the Lord's sake, even endure persecutions and so on, for his sake. And then he adds in chapter 10, for the sake of the gospel. That is another touch in connection with this Mark's gospel that's only here and in chapter 10. It says here then, secondly, for a testimony to them. So the suffering is here for my sake, because the servant identifies with his servant, but then at the same time that suffering in itself is a testimony to the leaders. And in that sense you can read the whole book of Acts. The whole book of Acts was a testimony to the leaders, either the Jewish religious leaders or the leaders in the Roman Empire. They were exposed to these testimonies to Paul. And by the way, that is one of the ways God, God has used he has used persecution to propagate the gospel. You can think about it. It's very interesting how the Lord has used persecutions to have the gospel propagate. Now verse 10, and the gospel must first be preached to all the nations. That is one of these verses that is so easily misunderstood. Because there are people who say, well, the Lord cannot come yet because the gospel, there are certain uh, populations still out there. They have not been reached with the gospel, so the Lord cannot come. You see, it, therefore it's so important to see the prophetic outline where this whole chapter really is either before the church started or after the church is already raptured. So this verse literally, prophetically, has to do with a different time frame. And uh, I think that is very important to understand this. And so after the rapture, yes, the gospel will be preached all over the world by these uh, faithful Jews who will be sent out and there will be a great harvest for God. You can see in Revelation 7 the result, the great multitude, you see how they are sealed in the beginning of chapter 7, that they will be protected even through the great tribulation. So there are very interesting details in the prophetic uh, writings like Daniel and uh, Revelation about these uh, who will preach. But of course, today, we can praise the Lord that indeed the gospel is preached to all the nations. That was the charge in, uh, uh, the, uh, excuse me, in Acts 1 verse 8. That's what the Lord said to the disciples in Mark uh, 16. So in that sense, it's also true today. But you cannot use a verse like this to say, so the Lord cannot yet come. Because that's an entirely different uh, line of thinking. The coming of the Lord for the church, the rapture of the church, is outside of God's ways with this world, outside of God's prophetic dealings. We have to understand that. And so when we apply a verse like this for us today, you may say, yes, the gospel must be preached to all nations, so let us uh, support that work. Let us do an effort. But you cannot use that verse to say, so therefore the Lord cannot yet come for us, for the church. Because the real background of this verse has to do with what will happen after the rapture of the church. Then the gospel will be preached to all the nations. Another thing in connection with this, it might help. Today we have the gospel of God's grace. doesn't mean that we, doesn't, we don't have to do anything with the kingdom. The gospel of the kingdom, as the Lord mentioned that in Matthew 24, will be preached after the rapture of the church was preached by John the Baptist before the church started, before the Lord came, was preached by the Lord himself also in the early days of his ministry. And today we have the gospel of God's grace, Acts 20. But also the gospel of the kingdom in a sense, because we are linked with the king, although we reject it on this earth. You can also say, in a sense, the gospel of the kingdom is presented today. But it is presented in its full, rich character as the gospel of the grace of God, connected with the God of glory connected with the God of all grace, and so on. That's wonderful. That's a very special character, and that is unique for our time. But as you compare this with Matthew 24, you see that the Lord refers to the gospel of the kingdom, literally. And so in that sense, it must refer, refer prophetically to the time after the rapture of the church. But I repeat once more, it's not to say that we should not do an effort to spread the gospel, of course. But it is now the day of grace, and is the gospel of God's grace that is preached. Now verse 11, but when they shall lead you away to deliver you up, be not careful. Perhaps freely translated, be not be confused. Be, do not worry beforehand as to what ye shall say. Again, you find it in the book of Acts. How 
Peter and Paul presented God's word without any time of preparation as to what he shall say. And in parentheses it says here in my translation, nor prepare your discourse. Again, a verse that can be abused. Uh, people say, well, it's wrong to prepare before you go to a meeting. It's wrong. No, we should be prepared. We should study the scriptures daily. In that sense, the apostles did that also, and they were always prepared. That's the point. But the Lord says, you won't have time to write down a sermon when you stand before the judge. You have to give an account right away. And then he says, don't worry, the Holy Spirit will be in you. That's again a difference. At that time, the Holy Spirit was not dwelling in the disciples yet. Now he does. And after the rapture of the church, the Holy Spirit will not dwell in the believers either. He will work through them. He will work in them. But he will not dwell in them. That's again a difference. But the Holy Spirit will speak through them, definitely. Verse, at the end of verse 11, that hour it will be given to you what you should speak, for ye are not the speakers, but the Holy Spirit. Now again, I refer back to what I said in the beginning. Do you not know the power of God? The Sadducees, the Pharisees didn't know the scriptures, neither the power of God. But two disciples, also after the rapture, they are supposed to know the resource of God, to know the scriptures and to be channels of the Holy Spirit, that the Holy Spirit can use them. So again, you see, there are two levels of interpretation, the literal prophetic line, and on the one hand, the moral application to us. And that's continuously the case in a chapter like this. Verse 12, But brother shall deliver a brother to death. Again, you can apply it to today. The misunderstanding between generations, generation gap. But here, literally, in prophecy, of course, it deals with the time after the rapture. But we see these things today. It's the same when you read the plagues in the book of Exodus. They, they, they contain moral lessons, also for our days. But literally, the plagues in Exodus are illustrations of God's future judgment. And so it's here. Literally, the Lord refers to those days after the rapture of the church, but morally, we can draw lessons from it for us today. Then we find in verse 13, And ye will be hated of all on account of my name. That's again such a touch, a wonderful touch, you know. We have seen, for my sake, in verse 9. Here, on account of my name. The disciple identifies with the Lord, and the Lord is not ashamed of his disciple. But then he goes on to say in verse 13, But he that has endured to the end, he shall be saved. That's again a verse that can be abused in so many ways. There are people who say, well, look, you can lose your salvation. There it is. That's not what the verse teaches. The point here is to underline the need for perseverance. And again, you have to realize, literally, the verse applies to those who will live after the church even. So if you would say literally, you take this verse to show that a believer can lose his salvation, it even doesn't make sense because it refers to a period after the rapture. But we can learn a principle from this, and that is that the Lord wants reality. That is a lesson we can learn for us today. The Lord wants reality. He doesn't want us to continue a lie. He wants reality. So that's what we can learn from this. The word endure literally means continue under. So you continue under the pressure. You continue under the trials. And again, we find it in Romans 5 for us today. How this principle applies for us today, that we should endure, go on. And then it says, he shall be saved. I think literally it refers to how those who will survive will be introduced into the millennium. They will be saved in that sense. Then all the trials will be over and in that sense they will be introduced living into the millennial reign. As Revelation 7 suggests, the sealed ones among the Jews or Israel will be uh, preserved by the Lord and then introduced into the millennium. But that's God's side. He will seal them. He will preserve them. But on their side... They have to endure. They have to go on. They have to persevere. They have to be faithful. And that, of course, is also a lesson we can apply to us. To be faithful and to go on in faithfulness and in reality. Now, verse 14. But when ye shall see, there a new section in this uh, uh, um, portion starts. It's a really a new uh, uh, portion introduced by the word but. But when ye shall see the abomination of desolation. Again, this shows very clearly that literally, prophetically, this is after the rapture of the church. Because, read Daniel 9, verse 26, 27, 28, uh, no, 27. Read Second Thessalonians 2, when in the temple of God, the temple is not be, has not been rebuilt yet in Jerusalem. So the Jews will rebuild the temple, not God, not the, um, but the Jews as a nation, in their zeal, and the uh, Messianic Jews, I mean, after the rapture, Messianic Jews then, they will serve God there. And uh, then in the middle of Daniel's week, 
That's why I said you have to study Daniel 9 to 12 to understand this. You have to study Revelation 13 to see the whole background situation, how they will be deal with the Western world, how uh, the leader of Israel, religious leader, political leader, will represent the leader of the Roman Empire and then introduce idolatry. Because this difficult expression, abomination, really refers to an idolatrous system. And that will cause the desolation. That will cause God to send judgment. And that is the word desolation. God will send judgment over this whole system. Again, this takes many scriptures to compare in order really to have uh, the right idea, an outline of this. Now, again, we can apply this to us. Can God allow idolatry in our lives? First John 5, verse 21 says, My children, flee idolatry. What has happened in the history of the church? It's, idolatry has been introduced and accumulated. So the whole religious system of the Christian profession have become a place of idolatry. Revelation 18 is very clear about it. A place for every unclean spirit. Isn't that terrible? So again, you can apply it also to the Christian profession. But the literal meaning here, the abomination of desolation, is explained in Daniel 9 with other scriptures. Now verse 14, in the middle it says, He that reads, let him consider it. The Lord underlines this. He refers to Daniel uh, 12, for example. And uh, he draws attention to it, a special attention to the disciples, for the disciples, that they would really notice this and take it at heart. So, here is spiritual understanding needed. I mentioned earlier already, who is wise. Here in Revelation 13, you find that those who will live in those days will have that understanding. The faithful will have the understanding, the number that they understand, the number of the beast, etc. That is uh, contained in these little princes. He that reads, let him consider it. There the Lord presupposes spiritual understanding in those who will be there then. And then he continues to say, then let those in Judea flee to the mountains. You see, he doesn't speak about persecution here. There will be persecution, evidently. Revelation 13 is very clear about it and other passages. But they flee because of the apostasy. They see there in the holy place, standing where it should not be. Here you don't have holy place, but in Matthew 24 you have holy place. Standing where it should not be, that is a clear sign of apostasy. And that is then for the faithful Jews in those days a clear sign that they should flee. And then the Lord said, let those in Judea flee to the mountains. See, the remnant will be kept in Jerusalem that will go through that time of the Great Tribulation. But those in Judea will flee to the mountains and also the other side of Jordan. You find it in Psalm 42, for example. There, the second book of Psalms starts out with this situation. The faithful Jews, as you find in the first book of Psalms, will have fled then. They are on the other side of Jordan because they fled because of the apostasy. And there is their situation then described in Psalms 42 and so on, as you study that. And so the Lord warns them not even go back to the house to get something there, but instant flight, verse 16. And then you see also the sympathy of the Lord, uh, how he identifies with the women who would be pregnant. And there another thing in verse 18, pray that it may not be in winter time. You see how the Lord sympathizes with his uh, people there. But again, more application for us, are we sympathizing with those who suffer? But then notice in verse 18, that it may not be in winter time. In Matthew 24, he says, pray that it not be on Sabbath. See, these religious Jews who will be there after the rapture of the church, who will serve God in the rebuilt temple, they will be faithful according to the laws of Moses and so on. And so that is something that really applies to them. Whereas the more general scope here is given for uh, servants and with the moral applications. Verse 19, for those days shall be distress. That is the great tribulation. And if you want to compare this with Revelation, that's the days of the trumpets. God will send trumpet judgments to reach the conscience of man. Great distress at the same time. The distress is in the first time, in the first place for the Jews, the faithful Jews. Jeremiah 30 uh, makes it very clear. Daniel 12 makes it also very clear. The distress is the great tribulation for the Jews. But also those who have accepted the gospel through them will be under persecution. And then in verse 20, uh, it shows the the real character of this, this, of, of this uh, great tribulation was never the case in the past, will never be in the future. And that's also mentioned in Jeremiah and other scriptures. And then notice in verse 20, no flesh should have been saved, but on account of the elect whom he has chosen, he has cut short those days. Here God intervenes for his elect, for the faithful ones. As I call them, the sealed ones of Revelation 7. They are the sealed ones. But you can also extend it 
to those who ex- have accepted the gospel and who will be preserved through the time of the great tribulation. The multitudes, as you find in Revelation 7, they will go through that time and they will be preserved and livingly be introduced into the millennium. But many martyrs will be there nevertheless. And so this verse says, if the Lord would not cut short those days, then all who die, all these faithful ones who die. Verse 21, then if anyone say to you, lo, here's the Christ, lo, there, believe it not. So the enemy will step up his propaganda, so to speak. We have already seen the danger of being misled in the early part of the 70th week, but then it will be even more dangerous because if people are persecuted and they see a glimpse of deliverance, they will grasp that. See, the temptation will be even higher to follow false uh, messiahs, false Christ, and so on, false prophets. So the Lord warns them again. And also in the Old Testament, you find already that Moses warns against false prophets, Deuteronomy 13, uh, also Zechariah 11, and many other pro- uh, scriptures. Revelation 13 shows the false prophet. And Peter, now to apply to our days, Peter speaks about false prophets in Second Peter 1 already. There would be false prophets also in the Christian profession. But again, that's an application. And then give signs and wonders to deceive. I refer to the plagues of, uh, under ex- uh, in the book of Exodus. There you find how the, the um, leaders there under Pharaoh, they imitated Moses. And so what Satan will work there in the great tribulation to try to mislead even the elect is if he cannot m- kill them, he'll try to mislead them or vice versa. He will attack them in many different ways. And one of the ways Satan attacks is by uh, mixing the truth with the lie, by imitation, counterfeit. So he comes with counterfeit. And again, that's true for the Christian profession, of course, Second Timothy 3. But then it will be really stepped up, and we find it also in Second Thessalonians 2, how the man of sin will reveal himself, and God will send that energy of error. That I tie in with the word must that we have seen a couple of times. This must develop this way because it is in God's governmental dealings with the whole uh, mankind that because they have rejected the gospel this whole process must go on and be brought to completion so there, uh, the enemy tries to deceive even the elect ones through his counterfeit signs and wonders the Lord Jesus did true signs and wonders of God the apostles also but there it will be false wonders and so the Lord has warned the Jews also for this if you uh, reject me then you will accept somebody else who will come in his own name here of course we see also pretending to be Christ in his name pretending but they will come nevertheless in their own name or in Satan's name of course now the Lord repeats once more in verse 23 but do ye take heed behold I have told you all these things beforehand again we can apply it to us too take heed be careful watch verse 24 then we have the third part, part now but in those days after that distress so we have first the beginning of sorrows then we have the great tribulation and then we have after that distress we see great things happening in creation in the book of revelation and other scriptures also we see sometimes that the sun stands for a great power representing god the moon uh, also moral power and the stars also um, in connection with dominion in connection with rule but Perhaps this verse also refers to literal things that will happen in creation. Great disturbances. And then in verse 25, And the powers which are in the heavens shall be shaken. In Hebrews 12 we know that will happen once more and then it's all over. Before the introduction of the millennial reign. Verse 26, And then they shall see the Son of Man. We have been singing in our hymn of the Lord Jesus, that we love him. Here the Lord Jesus presents himself as the Son of Man. In all simplicity, in all humility. We find him in Daniel 7. The Son of Man is also the Ancient of Days. He's the same person. He is God blessed forever. And he comes as Son of Man and God will entrust into his hands the reign of the whole universe. Psalm 8, the Son of Man. Wonderful. Psalm 80, you find also another reference to the Son of Man. Coming in clouds with great power and glory. What a contrast is his first coming in Luke 2, verse 27. Then shall he send his angels. Again, it's very clear. This cannot be the rapture. See, the rapture, First uh, Thessalonians 4 says very clearly, the Lord himself will come and take us away from this uh, earth. But then he shall send his angels and shall gather together his elect from the four winds, from end of earth to end of heaven. And so this will be, they will be collected on this earth, not to be brought to heaven. They will be collected on this earth. And the Lord will use his angels to do this. So prophet, God's providence, but also direct intervention of angels to bring them all back to the land 
and we have many prophecies about this. Then verse 28, but learn the parable. So now the Lord brings out a very important uh, teaching, a very important teaching. Again, that is also important for us. Learn the parable from the fig tree. As you know, the fig tree speaks about Israel, speaks of Israel as a national identity. And there was no fruit for the Lord. In connection with the natural condition of Israel, there was no fruit. And he cursed the tree. We have seen that in earlier chapters. But here, Israel will be introduced on a new basis, as I said earlier, on the basis of resurrection. They will be introduced, as the prophets uh, show that Ezekiel 37, 36, 37, there will be not only a national revival, there will also be a spiritual revival. And that is the way that the fig tree will blossom. But in God's dealings with this, God's preparations, it, that's the whole process. First, you get the branch, it becomes tender, and so there are phases. That is what I want to underline. There are phases. But the definite fulfillment is still future. We see in our days how these, this, these, these initial phases start. But, of course, natural Israel is under God's judgment. It has to undergo a spiritual renewal, as the prophets also indicate, before the Lord can really accept them as a nation. And then there will be fruitful God, verse uh, 28. You know that the summer is near. And the summer speak of the harvest. Then there is fruit for God. And in that sense, God will have fruit from Israel. There will be fruit for him from Israel. Verse 29. Thus also ye, when ye see these things happening, know that it is near at the doors. That's an encouragement for the, the remnant in those days of tribulation. When they have to go through this, they see, well, at the end of the tunnel, there's this light. And the Lord presents this already. But it's also important for us to understand that God's at work and uh, that uh, the fulfillment of all these things is very near. James 5 refers to that and many other scriptures. Verse 30, Verily I say unto you, this generation shall in no wise pass away. It's another verse that has been misunderstood in many ways till all these things take place. People have said, well, uh, 1948, Israel was rebuilt, so now in 40 years, there's a time of generation, it's just a guess. 1988, the Lord must come. See, these are speculations that they find no basis in Scripture. And we find it especially in connection with verse 32, where the Lord underlines this, of that day, of that hour, no one knows. See, the point in verse 30, this generation is a moral indication of the type of people that were there. They would continue. The unbelieving generation, the evil generation, they would continue all the way till the very end. But in the same time, you have the true generation of God either in our days, believers, or those believers after the rapture. That is another generation, of course. But this generation is this, what Moses already mentioned in Deuteronomy, this evil generation of rebels, really. They will continue till the very end. But then verse 32, in this context, is so wonderful. I said earlier, the Lord takes the place of a servant. And this verse is a mystery in itself. You really think about it, it's a mystery. It shows the greatness of the Lord Jesus. He is the Son but even the son doesn't know the things the father knows. Here he takes willingly a place of submission. And so here we see, in a sense, the human side of the Lord. Although he's at the same time God. But we cannot really understand this. It's really beyond our grasp. And there are script, uh, other scriptures parallel with this, that the Lord does not claim certain things for himself. It's not mine to give when the disciples came to ask a place at his right hand. And so, although he is God, he could give it as God. But he leaves that with the Father. And so here he leaves this with the Father. But of course, in itself, logically speaking, we cannot understand this. How can the Son with God not understand something that the Father knows with God? This is beyond our comprehension. But a line uh, the Lord takes here that helps us to understand, he takes the place of a servant. And the servant is not supposed to know what the, re the Mass really has in mind. The servant is supposed to uh, obey the orders he receives. That's the place the Lord takes here. Now, the end of the chapter, I like to tie in with uh, chapter 14, which we'll have the next time, Lord willing. It's a great encouragement for us today. And this, again, this is a, another transition, as we find also in Matthew. After the prophetic outline he gives in connection with Israel, the Lord speaks about the disciples specifically, what they would need. And so we need to heed, uh, to take heed, to watch, and to pray. Of course, the disciples who will live after the rapture, they will have the same needs as we.